And I can tell the prop right next to my face is just working double time. Like it's cranking. It's struggling. And so I look out what we got going on below us. This is what country? Mongolia. Mongolia. Solid mountains as far as you can see. Like so I look out my window and see certain death. I'm like, no, okay, well landing isn't an option. Well in the leopard hunt, when that thing shows up, that is spike there. is so great. That if you were to maintain that, I mean, I think my heart would probably just explode. Really? But, um, yeah, that's probably the the coolest, like, animal experience. And I see some movement. And I go back down. And this tree is full of goats. Full of ibex. <laughs> Hanging out over the ledge. <laughs> like. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. Uh, I'm in a hotel room. <laughs> uh, next to the bed video camera rolling um in where are we reno yeah reno Reno, at the sheep show i almost said vegas yeah it's not vegas not vegas i think the nevadans would be upset with you if you mix the two up i don't know there are casinos everywhere so it sort of seems like vegas yeah it's got the feel yeah and i'm i'm here with uh jason price and dallas haymeyer and um I first met Dallas uh, on an elk hunt over alfalfa in Montana, <laughs> floating floating canals. What an interesting experience <laughs> that was. <laughs> that was fun. That was really fun. Yeah. And uh, and so Dallas is a um, world traveling uh, cameraman. Um, yep. Been all over crazy places in the mountains. Of name a few. Oh, New Zealand, Tajikistan, Mongolia, Turkey, Tanzania, Alaska, BC, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> he's been a few places, and he's a um, he's uh, caught a few. Uh, he's had diarrhea a few times. <laughs> yeah, in Mongolia. <laughs> yes. Oh, you also got that face. Ah, I got a staph infection in Tanzania <laughs> on my face. It seemed like it was about to take over. That was a horrifying experience. <laughs> I remember telling you that in the field, and you were like, oh, my gosh. And you were telling me your uh, – uh, Spent some time in India. In India. Oh, my gosh. That sounded worse than anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I got something there that stuck with me for days. I've never been that sick in my life. Well, Dallas brings it on himself. He drank a live bacteria, like just sitting in a jar in a yurt in the corner. He's like, what's that? <laughs> Lady says, um, she, she says she, something. I she mean, said it's great for your uh, for your. She didn't say system. anything. <laughs> the, the, the lady like has never spoke a word of English in her life. <laughs> well, that's what so, I heard. <laughs> so what she said like was translated by a translator and told Dallas, oh, yeah, it's good for you. So uh, – it did not look good for you. <laughs> I so showed you it. You drank it. I oh drank yeah. It. So like, I have no sympathy. I mean, that's that's stupid. Yeah, yeah. But the funny thing is, it's probably it's definitely more sanitary. My wife drinks sanitary the, than what? My wife drinks the same kind of thing that is that's like USDA <laughs> no. or FDA approved. <laughs> but it is oh right it, yeah. it in is, the US. Yeah. It is a bacteria though. But it's the same, Jason. Oh, I know, it's, it's exact the same. same. Yeah. In fact, that's probably, I have the real stuff. Patented. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so Jason, tell me your story because uh, you you've you're the you, you're not a camera guy. You're the actual guy that hunts. Yeah. So uh, I'm lucky enough to get hunt all over the world, mm-hmm. and it didn't start out that way. I started out like everyone from Texas hunting whitetail deer, and honestly, it, I was in a bubble there just because nine, ten years old. I didn't realize what there was anything else besides whitetails. Mm. So I uh, went on my first elk hunt in my 20s. And um, from then, it's just like being that close to elk with the bugling and the interaction between that, the hunting, uh, different hunting style, as opposed to sitting in a blind in Texas was just, it lit a fire in me that I'm like, wow, there's other things out there. So from that point on, it's just been kind of a, a wild ride to progression. Yeah, it is. Everyone goes through like a hunting progression. Mine started with whitetails, and now I'm on to sheep and goats, and it's, it's a lot of fun. 
And uh, I was I was asking uh, Jordan to fill me in on kind of your background, and I've watched all the. Uh, so you guys have a YouTube channel, correct? Yeah. Hunt Hunt the Experience. Um, or, that, it's just the experience. Uh, say it again. On YouTube, the experience. The experience. Okay. And um, I've watched all those videos. And uh, who's the cameraman? Well, like <laughs> sometimes Dallas is uh, on the ones that are like subpar. Uh, <laughs> We, you know, we'll bring in a real camera guy on some of these hunts. Okay. So, You're right. So it makes us look a little bit better. But no, <laughs> Dallas has been filming really the last two years yeah. solid with me and, and mm-hmm. around the world, which I mean, the experience isn't just about me. Yeah. Um, our goal from the very beginning was to showcase hunting and not an individual. I saw a flaw in the TV industry, one, which I thought it was dying, but two, that it was always seemed to be focused around one single individual or one single location. The hunter. Yeah. Especially, so, yeah. And after a while, that gets a little monotonous or or maybe a, a certain amount of jealousy builds up with the viewer and like, oh, that guy gets to hunt all over the place. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to watch him anymore. But I mean, our, our overall goal. <laughs> I like how Jason's just real. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I didn't like it, but also I was jealous. Yeah. A little bit jealous. I mean, sure. I mean, I think it's human yeah. nature for, oh, I wish I could do that. I mean, we all do it, but... But no, I think we've talked about hunting TV a lot on this podcast and it does not, for, a lot of it is just not very good. No. And, and part it, of it's, the, I think, the economic business model that is behind it. Sure. How you get into it, you know, mm-hmm. it's not like a lot of other TV networks and they don't operate the same. Right. It's not how good your show is and how much, how many people view it. It's just, you got to buy airtime. And then, so anybody that comes to it with money can then get the show on the air. Um, and then it's just a weird way to do it. Right. And if your ratings aren't very good, it doesn't matter if you stay. Well, no, if your ratings aren't very good on TV, they'll just make them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <So>. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Uh, digital doesn't really lie. No, no it like, doesn't. You're down- and you guys have done really good. Like your downloads. Tell me about this when you started it. So the funny thing is Dallas and I were talking the other day. I was like, hey, the YouTube channel seems to have dropped off a little bit. Like during the holidays and the mm-hmm. conventions, the numbers have just – drop down a little so man we need to release another film and we have tons and it's like it's dropped down like 30 or forty thousand views and i was like but don't get all that worked up because it's like four hundred thousand views more than it was this time last year (laughs) right the trend is not but it's still overall it's still no it's good uh, and and we've gotten lucky i mean there's like i said i don't think we could pinpoint a formula to to how it's done mm -hmm. that but at the same time, the focus just – we just wanted it to be the outdoors and hunting, and I think that was a lot more broad. And, and Dallas's cinematography ability um, was kind of the main aspect that we wanted to concentrate on. And uh, I think just overall, the team of how it just kind of all came together has made it And Dallas, do well. you don't really edit the film. You don't produce it. You just – you mostly no, film. So I'm fil- I film it all, and then I cut it all. And kind of do a rough edit. Mm-hmm. And then I started off doing some of the editing at the start. And my schedule has just gotten way too crazy. As you know, the editing takes, you know. Way almost, longer. It's, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it takes as long or long. It takes twice as long as the hunt even. If so, you want it to so if I'm be gone, good. So if I'm yeah. gone for, you know, 10 days on a hunt, you know, it's going to require a couple of weeks of editing after the hunt. And my schedule just got so full that. Yeah. Well, when you film this stuff and you put it out there and you know, you kind of had this goal, the, you had a vision for what you wanted it to look like and that I, I assume just resonated a lot more with you and your idea of what hunting is. Sure. Um, it, and I knew if we could focus on the things outside and around hunting, that there was a greater chance of intriguing people to, to come and, and start hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if we promote hunting, then obviously we're going to have a larger audience and that was kind of the overall goal, but, the unique thing about Dallas was I had this vision, had some other camera guys, because like I've been filming for two and a half years before Dallas started uh, working with us, and um, they were great, but it was a lot. It required a lot of like field production on my my part. So I was like, "Hey, we need to get this shot. We need to get, to get this shot." And it was really hard to concentrate on the hunt because I mean we're getting to do some incredible hunts, right? And if I'm focused on trying to make sure the camera guys getting the stuff like we should be getting. It kind of takes away from the hunt itself, and and I didn't want to, I didn't want that. But Dallas and I met on a trip to Mexico. Just it was randomly. I mean, we were both going to the same destination. Jason we wasn't even both, hunting. No, 
<laughs> we were doing. I was actually just going to check out this place because I wanted to hunt desert sheep. Mm-hmm. So I had a friend, Dan Catlin, going. So I thought, well, hey, I'll just go along. I'll check this place out and see if it's something that I'm interested in, in doing next year. And met Dallas, and we're driving out. And Dallas and I talked in the airport a little bit. But when we were driving out to this place, I was thinking in my mind, man, you know, if I was doing my show, I'd get this shot or that shot. Mm-hmm. Like right when the thought came into my mind, Dallas is like, hey, stop the car. He gets out, and he's he's going and getting the shots exactly like, you know, I would have done. So at that point, I knew that. Dallas was a lot better at that than me. Yeah. When we were in Montana, uh, the exact same thoughts went through my mind. I'm, it was such a load off too, because you know, Casey and Jordan and Aaron Snyder are not going to come through when it comes to filming your hunt. Um, sorry, Jordan. Um, they're, they're not bad. I mean, they're good. They're good with like, uh, you know, talking smack and vlogging. But, uh, when it comes to like capturing, uh, the right stuff at the right time. Uh, when I spent a couple days with Dallas, it was just all getting recorded. Yeah. All the stuff that I would normally get. The other thing I noticed with him was uh, he didn't film too much either. So from my perspective, not not uh, having as quite as much experience, I, I tend to over film. Sure. And so I have a lot of post video to go through that never is going to make it into a movie. Yeah. And um, Dallas is pretty efficient about that. So it was neat to to see him work and then actually get the freaking shot. Like so many cameramen don't turn the camera on or when the animal's coming out, they blow it for you or, you know, they just don't get it on film. So Or they give the memory card to some foreigner to put in his computer <laughs> and reformat the disc. Did that happen? Oh, in Tajikistan it did, but I mean it was conven- it was convenient, convenient for me and for you when he misses this giant sixty inch ram. Yeah. The theme, the footage miraculously gets formatted. Yeah. yeah, I told that guy like in my greatest Tajik accent, <laughs> destroy that memory card when you please it reformat you. the memory card. So when you guys did the first couple videos, you just plan to put it on um, YouTube. Uh, well, not really. There was there was a couple of different uh, people that had been reaching out to us over probably a six month period about a platform coming that was going to be a Netflix top platform. Yeah, that would be seen on TV, and so we tried to actually hold out a little bit for that, and um, it just really didn't materialize as fast as we thought it would. And it actually, I think there's a few of them starting up now, but. Um, I think one day we just decided, hey, let's let's give YouTube a shot. And yeah, our goal again. last year, when we started putting them on YouTube, <laughs> I was like, I think we want to go this digital route. We all kind of agreed yeah. that that was the way we wanted to go. And our goal was a killer year would be 5,000 subscribers. That was our goal. I was five thousand like, subscribers. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I was like, if we can start like from this zero channel, to five thousand, I was like, no problem. I was like. That'll be good. I was like, we put out good films, promote it. I was like, I think, I think we can hit that. And we passed twenty thousand yesterday. So yeah, and it's been just yeah, it's been doing here. it's been doing good. We like we've enjoyed yeah. that platform and how it works and and, and with twenty thousand subscribers. But you guys, what kind of views have you been getting on the films? <sighs> We're mean, getting about half a million views a month. Yeah. So and there's not very many. What? How many do you have on there? I don't know. I don't, fifteen, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say ten to 12 fifteen. Twelve to fifteen. And that's the hard thing. I mean, these are like big hunts, and yeah, and some crazy destinations. And 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 Dallas's schedule outside of the experiences is nuts as well. So we're getting some content mm-hmm. like we originally wanted to do, that where we're kind of brought in our circle, where we're getting some some really cool hunts because I obviously can't go on all of them, but. um yeah, if we could try to drop, like, we have vault films and we have feature films. Mm-hmm. So our goal was kind of try to drop one vault film a month and one feature film a month with probably a teaser in the middle. But, like, every time we come up with this plan to do, to get on that sort of system, something comes up, there's, you know, another cool opportunity and just messes up the whole deal. But that's the overall plan. What do you think, it, what do you think the audience, um, why do you think it's done so well? Because some of your, like... What's your highest downloaded uh, f- video? Mm, well, we have three right now that are like on track. 
for the millions. So his Jason's moose hunt is at like 1.5 million. Uh, yeah, 1.5 million. And that was I mean, it's just a it's a crazy film. I mean, it starts off with uh I wasn't supposed to be on that hunt and I ended up like maybe two weeks like it was very last minute I ended up going. Mm-hmm. So we This is something we really never talked about. So yeah. we're sitting there waiting to get on all the planes and well, hang on, you got to back up because like this moose hunt was a big hunt and I just, I wasn't going to film it. I was just going to go do one myself and just relax yeah. and, and have fun. And I was three weeks before the moose hunt. I Dallas calls you many times. And it's like, we have got to film this hunt. Mm-hmm. So I called this guy and I was like, Hey, you know, we're going to film it. What, what needs to happen? And he's like, no problem. You know, we'll take care of it. So we make it all happen. We get there. Well, like what unfolded? I mean, you you could say this could have happened or that could have happened, but I'm relatively certain I would have been on that airplane had I not brought Dallas. And um, if anyone's watched the film, they know that that airplane had a midair collision and everyone died. But it's yeah, just, tell me about this story. It was um, so you know a, a typical Alaskan hunt. You you go to a hangar somewhere to wait to be flown out, um, and that's what we're doing. We're sitting around hanging out. Talking to everyone and uh, yeah, the outfitter the guides, comes in, meeting. divides everyone up to get into the airplanes based off of where they're going and, and how many people are going on the trip. And uh, one of our good friends now, Todd Gloka, gets on one plane with his uh, wife and uh, they take off and Zach and Jeff get on another one and uh, the two other, the outfitter and the guide get on another one. They just all take off and, you know, the turnaround time for us should be an hour and a half, maybe two hours. So it's... 10 30 11 o'clock so in they the drop morning. off and they come back and get you yeah, i mean that's the plan and mm-hmm. so it's probably 10 o'clock in the morning by now and, and no one's getting restless or anything because we're all talking and getting to know the other guys mm-hmm. and the there was the blevins brothers were in the camp with us they're really cool guys from texas mm-hmm. uh so we're just kind of messing around with them everyone's having fun they're bet you know we're about to go on a moose hunt that's that's obviously going to be an awesome hunt so um it gets to about lunchtime and the guys come in. And they're said, what, two or three hours? Yeah, we're three hours into it, and they should be back. But, I mean, anything can happen. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, you never in know. I mean, they could like, land, yeah. and, you know, they may have to help set up a tent, or, you know, you don't mm-hmm. know. So, and, and, and to be honest, at this point, we're not even really thinking of, of anything. But there was a guy that comes in and is like, hey, did you guys hear what happened? And they're like, no, 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 you know, everything's fine. But I just kind of caught it, you know. From a distance, that you mm-hmm. know something, but I, still nothing popped into my head. So, the guy from the hangar came in. I said, "Hey, you guys want to go to lunch? You know, there's some sort of situation with the flying." So, I'm like, no problem. We go to lunch and we come back, and I like I'm start things are starting to run through my head. Like something's not right. And I tell Dallas and the Blevins guys, I was like, "Hey, and you know, I've gotten to do this quite a few times. Mm-hmm. This is like something's going. Something's on. up. Mm-hmm. We something's, saw, something's I think weird." At that time we saw. We had seen a search and rescue plane. Yeah, the search and rescue plane was like right by the hangar that was and it about was to like go out. Taking off. Yeah, there was a helicopter. But I mean, like, it's just like all these little things are starting to add up. Like, something's not right. But well, we're in Bethel, Alaska. I mean, there's not many people. Yeah, so right. If something. So I step out because there's no reception inside the hangar, and I get on the sat phone and I call one of my buddies, and I don't know why I called that particular guy. And as soon as I called, the first thing he said is, "Oh my God, thank God." And I'm like, what? He goes, um, there's been a midair collision with your outfitter in Bethel, Alaska, and all five people are dead. Well, the first thing goes through my head, Todd, his wife, and that pilot just took off. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, two sets of, uh, two planes take off with two sets of guys in each. And I'm like, our two planes just crashed midair. And, you know, all five of the seven people that just left here, um, so I go in immediately to the hangar to the guy in charge, and I was like, hey, um, I'm, like, mad. I'm like, this is not right. I, I don't know what's going on, but, you mm-hmm. know, we need to be told what's going on. There's been a midair collision, and, you know, everyone's dead. And it was, insen- it was like, insensitive of me because these are their friends. Right. You know, I mean, they they have, like, personal relationships with these guys we met them for 10 minutes right but you know they have like personal relationships with them and so like the look on their face was just like so i was like hey you know we just need to figure out what's going on because 
they were like two minutes away from going to my house to tell my wife. So, and there's other people there in the right. hangar that most likely the same thing is happening. I mean, it went right. out on some national news alert. Right, right. So, um, but yeah, just a terrible tragedy. What had happened is, and it was like the most crystal clear day you could possibly imagine. There is not a cloud in the sky. That never happens in Alaska, by right. the way. Yeah. But it's just like this perfect day. And um, so Zach and Jeff are flying out to the hunting area. And there is a plane taking off from Mission, Alaska. And it's about uh, four miles from where the crash was. As that plane takes off, it just never gets altitude. I don't know if, if those people were like looking down at the ground, just kind of sightseeing or what. And um, it was just. A, a complete freak accident. Uh, I can't even imagine how they described how that it. Is they said it was almost too clear, like no one had their guard up, like they were just so the, the last midair collision like in Alaska. T-boned. They said they just t-boned, huh? I the mean, last collision they said was twenty-two years before that. Like that's yeah, the odds. Yeah. Well, there's crashes in Alaska all the time. I mean, you know, they're hitting trees because they're taking off. Right. I expect, I expect that. Like our but, guide, um, Aaron and I, when we got dropped off this year in British Columbia <clears throat> on the mountain goat trip with Bart, we, we got dropped off and then, um, then the plane went to take off. And as he's taken off, we're looking at it and like, Oh, he's not going to, he's not going to clear those trees. He's not going to clear those trees. And we're like, and, and I mean, he's a really good fly. He's crazy number of hours behind a plane and that wing poof, cut the top of a tree off. Oh my God. And, and then kept going. Yeah. Like it didn't actually, you know, I mean, it's kind of normal, but it doesn't take much <laughs> no. for that wing to come right off and die, and the dude's dead. Right. No, like those wings are so t- thin. You touch I mean, those planes. I mean, yeah, they just, don't weigh very much. No, 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 they're not at all. Skeletons. And I saw that and I'm like, how many hours does he have? Like, I don't want to fly, but they loaded it down real heavy and they're carrying a lot of gear back and forth and your runway is only so big and you misjudge that or the wind comes. And there's a lot of variables, a lot of temperature, wind, uh, you know, there's, there's a ton of variables. In Mongolia this year. (laughs) You do. I am like, you are, you have a death wish. Yeah. Yeah, We lost, we lost a prop on our commercial flight. A prop. Yeah. That happened to me in India. Like luckily we have two. It seems to one be of a normal thing in some third world places. Yeah. It was not so normal to the flight attendant. So, <laughs> so we're sitting there. You told me. And yeah. uh Tamir, the outfitter. And this is a domestic flight, like a yeah. normal Mongolian Air. Mongolian Air. <laughs> that should have been the red flag right there. Yeah. And in fact I probably have the app on my phone. <laughs> How many Mongolian Air flights went down last year? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I flew. I've um, got my headphones on. Arab Airways or something like that, yeah. or and uh, they have the highest crash record. Oh yeah, that's in comforting. In it. And I got on there, and there are people with like chickens and stuff on there. <laughs> Just the weirdest. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he taps me on the shoulder. I'm kind of just dozed out, mm-hmm. and he's like, he points out the window, and he's sitting next to uh, Matt, our hunter, who. Mm-hmm. Has horrible flight anxiety. <laughs> who at one point stopped a commercial flight on the runway and got off the plane. Just doesn't, <laughs> just doesn't, ha- doesn't have a good time. So not, does not enjoy flying. So, okay. And so Tamir's trying not to wake him up, and he points out the window, and we happen to be sitting on the wings. So I look, I look out, and the props the just prop doing is- a slow turn, and I look out my <laughs> other window, and, and this one's ripping. And he's like, he looks at me really seriously, and he's like, "Are we gonna be okay?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, I'm like, yeah, that's why there's two. <laughs> and I can tell the prop right next to my face is just working double time, like it's cranking, it's struggling. And so I look out, what we got going on below us. This is what country? Mongolia. Mongolia. Solid mountains as far as you can see, like." So I look out my window and see certain death. I'm like, no, okay, well, landing isn't an option. And so we're sitting there, and I'm just like, it's fine. I've been in a lot of small planes before, so I was like, just go to sleep. You'll wake up and be there. And so then all of a sudden I see the flight attendant That's walks. That's what you call denial. 
It is. The flight attendant walks over to the seat across, and and the guy is pointing out the window, and she just runs to the front of the plane, and I'm like, which helps. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> she comes back out on the intercom, and it's just frantic panic. You know, she's probably. 25, you know, new to the job, but she is panicked and she's just passing out all these flyers, which are typically in the back of your seat. So she Mm -hmm. hands me the flyer and it's where your life vests are and how to evacuate on a crash landing. Put your head between your knees. And this was the first time I looked at it and I just set it down and I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to (laughs) die. I was like, this is how it's going to happen. <laughs> and now everyone is chattering. I, I can't understand anything. <laughs> uh-huh. And yeah, it was pretty eerie for about. You're just looking around for the live bacteria to drink. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, at this point, the closing my eyes thing wasn't working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we rerouted like three hours to another airport. And then as we were coming in for landing, I was like, Okay, I've been on a lot of flights this year, and we're going two to three times faster than we should be going. I was like, how long is this runway? <laughs> going to jump the runway? <laughs> Dallas is now backseat flying. <laughs> yeah. And we made it. We landed. And then we get off. And they're oh, wait. Like, Didn't you tell me that the, what, that the stewardess was crying? <laughs> <laughs> there were people on the plane crying. She, she was Did very she hold close. It together? Yeah. No, she, was, she had lost it, though. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she was like, I'm dying. Like, I'm, I'm just, I got to get, my, my job yeah. is to hand out all these yeah. flyers. Once I'm but done, we're I'm dead. done. I I'm quit. Dead. And so then we land and, oh, in the middle of all that, Matt wakes up. And <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> he is thrilled. I can see him <laughs> just looking out both windows and I'm like, and then we land and they're like, all right, we're going to fix the plane. <laughs> And you had to use that same plane again. No, no, listen. Oh. And Matt's like, we're driving. He's like, I'm not getting back on that plane. We're driving. And I was like, <laughs> how far is the drive? And they're like, well, we're, you know, about an hour and a half flight to where you want to be in Ulaanbaatar and, or a 12 hour drive. And Matt's like, I'm fine with it. We're driving. Oh, I take the chance on flying. And I was like, <laughs> oh man, 12 hours in Mongolia. I was like, <sighs> I think I might would rather get on that plane. <laughs> and, <clears throat> they ended up flying another plane about six hours later at one or two in the morning, and we take off with a this, backup engine. Cause and we take now. off, and That's this good. was the this was one of the craziest parts. We take off in one of the worst lightning storms I've ever been in in my life, like insanity turbulence. So everyone, we almost we just lost an engine. We get on the next plane. <laughs> And horrid turbulence. Now you're like going it's through the eye of the storm. On, yeah, going through the eye of the storm. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. And I was like, <laughs> starting all over. So how's Matt during this? Oh. Like pissed you guys didn't drive? Yeah, he was not happy. But yeah. we made it. And so flying the last couple of years hasn't been great. I think more people die from the flights than they do the hunting. <laughs> yeah. In I'm those sure. kind of places. I'm remote sure. places. <clears throat> I heard something about uh, like Alaska bush plane pilots and you know no, the survival right. rates and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a few books written by Alaska pilots like titled "I Shouldn't Be Alive." Yeah, it's comforting when you go. Yeah, there. right. Exactly. It's like, and having been on a few of them now in some sketchy places, I'm like, I don't like it. When we flew out of that spot in BC with the goats, <laughs> we're, same runway where you almost hit, he hit the tree. Yes, <laughs> and so. <laughs> We got all your gear and goats now. Yeah, and he's got this. You know, he checks the gas with like a wooden dipstick that's homemade. <laughs> like how much gas? Oh is yeah, in that's there. Like there's no fuel gauge. Oh, and they're not accurate. The fuel gauge. No. Whenever you ask him, you're like, "Is that is that empty? <laughs> what about? No, that? they're not accurate at all. It's like, <laughs> what about right. the oil soaked rag? You have any of those on the dash? You're like right. stuck in some yeah, hole. And yeah. so you're wondering if this thing's gonna make it out of there. And as it's flying, there's a there's a wall. There's a wall of mountains, and we're not high enough. <laughs> and this thing's just not getting higher. And I'm like, I'm looking back at the, in, at Aaron, and I'm like pointing outside, like, dude, this <laughs> do is you it. see this mountain? <laughs> this is it. And he's like, the guy only had so much fuel. 
And uh, he's like, yeah, we have enough to fly like another like 30 minutes. And and so you're you're doing the math. There's not a you can't like back out now. You're you're committed. So I'm looking at the mountain range and it's not getting higher and higher and higher. And finally, as he kind of goes through this and there's this little tiny gully in the in the there's a dip at this mountain t- tips of the mountains and he goes flying right through that little dip and i swear our wings about to hit the side and i'm looking out the window and i'm like dude i could jump out and survive right now like this is so the thought actually crossed your mind to it jump was out. freaking scary and the plane's now going like it's not even hardly moving it's like there's a wind bluff coming over the so you're just kind of hanging there like kind of floating you're like get over get over get over get over and aaron's just in the back like "Eh, we die we die it's just kind of (laughs) what happens you know what can you do about it and get over the top and i'm like i hate doing that i hate it every time so was that your first mountain goat yeah it was my first mountain goat yep what do you think about that um there were multiple times where i thought you know on the side of a cliff looking down like thousands of feet like Aaron's goat fell 2000 feet yeah <laughs> fell to the bottom which means you have to go back down there to get it dude it was straight it wasn't like you know when you look at some oh, there's, those things goat, just cliffed out they're crazy yeah some mountain goat places where it's like there's a cliff and then a ledge uh-huh. and a little slope from hill and then it's mountainous right no this was just a wall yeah. 2000 foot wall and this thing fell the whole <laughs> way to the bottom you know, it hit like at one point and rolled and then fell another 500 feet. When he got to it, it was like hammered. Yeah. He said it was like a giant bloody tampon. That's how he described it. Uh, I just got morbid. a visual of that. <laughs> but <I was> like, <laughs> the horns were, were gone. <laughs> like the one had like a two inch. The I'm other trying to had poke my mind's eye out <laughs> over here. I'm like still struggling with that. <laughs> anyway, it was a, uh, it was, um, yeah, it was just it's a, a great bad, analogy. A sack of that's that's yeah. Aaron's good at those. Yeah, because uh, I got the visual. I <laughs> it was just a sack of, yeah. it, and um, <clears throat> but you know, we actually ate it, and it was really good. Yeah, so great burger. Maybe <clears throat> you. I mean, it, but it was hammered. Yeah, but that was a really. It was an amazing hunt. I. So but how many multiple days did it times, take you to get the goat? Uh, I think Aaron killed his on the third day. I killed mine on the fourth. Both Did you guys climb with, up and with stay bows. or with up? bows? Oh wow! Yeah, bows. Yeah, that's really impressive. <clears throat> we were. Um, I got mine on day five with a gun. <laughs> we rode in on horseback, and um, um, from a drop camp, you know, we got flown in to where the camp is, and then we rode horses like seven, eight miles. Out. What what elevation were you guys at when you were? I think it there? was eight or nine. Yeah, I think it was around eight. Mm. Yeah. I think my arse was like seven, eight. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's an awesome hunt. Dude, when we got up there, I mean, there, when you're up there, it was just ice on and, and bare rocks, you know. But, yeah, dude. For a mountainous there was, hunt. There were times where we were jumping over gaps that were thousands of feet down. Yeah. You know, like a three foot or two foot jump from one side of the ledge to another. Things like that, or you're on a cliff on the side, and I'm like, and and I can't help but think how foolish the whole thing is, yeah. but you're doing it anyway, right? And <laughs> you're yeah, it's like getting on the airplane in Mongolia. Yeah, you're, you're committed. You're like, and it's a rush. It's exciting. It's it's fun, and then you're creeping up on a goat who's on the edge of a cliff. When I shot my goat, <clears throat> it was uh, it was terraced, and it looked like Machu Picchu. Mm-hmm. You know, like. Just and so it was super easy to. It was a nice area to stock. Now getting up to the spot was a little tricky, but once we got up there, I mean, it was fairly. It was nice. It wasn't up on a two thousand foot cliff like Aaron's. Mm-hmm. Aaron's was in the worst spot. Imaginable. Oh, the worst spot imaginable. Yeah. Which is how Aaron likes it. And then when he <laughs> shoots the goat, it ran, runs over, and and proceeds to to die. It lays down. This is a perfect shot. I think it was 55 yards. Perfect shot. It runs, it lays down, and they're like, oh, dude, sweet. It went where we hoped it would. And then it lays down, and then its leg flops over like they do so often, and then gone. Gone. Like mine was done, and then it did its one last 
suicide jump. <laughs> right. It's so, like, why? Why did you, <laughs> why did you, why did you do that? <laughs> you knew. You're like, if, if I'm going down, you're not no going to get me. No one can have me. <laughs> yeah. And so, but where I shot mine, it was really nice because it was, but um, uh, Roger had to grab my pants and hold on to me as I leaned over because <clears throat> the goat was not just straight down. It was in a cave beneath us and that's not a shot you practice no ne- i've never i had to almost shoot back at my own feet yeah Bo- bokehouse is probably as close as you can get like yeah. the last shot yeah that's it yeah the total archery challenge yeah. and snowbird yeah i was leaned over and and i'm like trying to get my bubble to to work with me but it's did you I'm just aiming, give up on the bubble but i'm aiming back at myself <laughs> And I'm like, the bubble's saying, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, hey, look, I couldn't get it. So I'm tweaking the bow all around trying to figure out how to make the bubble move where it needs to move. <laughs> Finally, it gets there and I'm like, okay. And I have a hinge release and I'm being really careful not to let it go off. That was probably so, the least ideal situation ever. And so I finally I get it there and then I start pulling through the shot and you can hear it click. You know, and that's the, it clicks just before it actually goes off, you know. And I'm thinking it's so close because I think it's, you know, I think it's like, I think it's 12 feet away, the goat. Oh, my gosh. So if I, w- I could jump on it, right? <clears throat> so, but the angle is really strange. And so I'm trying to make sure I'm executing this and it, that the arrow is actually going to go where I think it's going to go. Because close shots like that at your those angles. Your arrow almost hits below your sight. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's probably messing with your head a little. You're like, wait. Yep. Is this where I'm supposed to be? And plus, at? when you're aiming like that, you're trying to bend at the waist, mm-hmm. so you're not bending yeah, that's at like the shoulders. Horribly difficult. And so all of it's weird. And then you're trying not to fall off a cliff because <laughs> I mean it's 12 feet away, but it's on a ledge. It's probably a 20 foot, 30 foot drop. Yeah. And so I don't want to go over. No. So anyway, um, it was a killer. It was just a, it, the hunt, the stock, getting that close to a mountain goat. Um, the whole thing is is just a uh, an epic. There's no other word to describe it. I mean, for a mountain hunt, that's probably the the best valued hunt in North America. I I mean, I'm walking around. We're at the sheep show here in Reno, and 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 obviously there is a <clears throat> at the sheep show. You're going to see a lot of sheep. Yeah, of course. It's and like I'm looking around, sheep and I'm hunters like, heaven. I kind of want a goat show, but there isn't one. I, well, I mean, kind of next week at GSCO, a yeah. lot of a lot of goats from around the world. But I mean, no one seems to concentrate on the North American goat. Well, which is like a such a cool hunt. It's the goats, the ibex. They're my. I love sheep awesome. hunting. See, I love it. They're but awesome. Ibex hunting is is awesome. Well, that's what I'm thinking. It's like I've always, and I don't know why, I've always thought mountain goats are badass. They are. Like the shoulders, the necks, the, I'm, I'm making a film for Western Hunt Expo that we're going to show there in a couple of weeks. And, um, I'm trying to like pump up the mountain goat in this film because I think it's <laughs> underappreciated. Oh, most definitely. And I was, comp- I was doing research on mountain goats compared to, bighorn sheep and compared to ibex and i've seen some videos and some photos of goats doing things on the side of cliffs that an ibex and a bighorn could never do never like they're like the mountain goat is the undisputed beast when it comes to terrifying maneuvers yeah we've got some film of an ibex in turkey and it is jumping from a cliff to a like a three inch diameter branch that is suspended out over a thousand oh, feet drop. I've least. got phone scope footage of I'm glassing. <laughs> Are you and kidding me? No, I'm not joking. This, and all it's of a sudden, jumping from the rock I'm like cliff face panning to a branch. Up, and I see some movement and I go back down. And this tree is full of goats. Full of ibex. <laughs> Hanging out over the ledge. <laughs> like twenty, thirty feet up the tree. Ibex eating the branches, eating the vegetation. Yeah, I. I mean, one slip. I I've mean, got no. Anyway, we don't moves. have to hunt. We just trees go move. Rocks. How they're getting in the tree? They're jumping <clears throat> off the cliff into the tree to get up into that height. And a few of them. Remember the video where the one doesn't make it? it bounces off like yeah. it hits and doesn't get its footing and just just comes right back to the just, you know one little rock on the cliff falls out. It's crazy. crazy. Yeah, I, there's some cool. When I picture it, I. 
Yeah. No, they're, I, they're, they're crazy. It's yeah. unbelievable where they can go, what they can do, we, and you just don't think about it. No, and, and I, I think the way that goats, the shoulders are and the big white fur, the black horns, um, they just, they're, they're just cool. And I think because they have l- just the smaller horns, they just don't have the mass like a, like a big horn or sure, an ibex sure. that be- people undervalue they do. them. Yeah. yeah for but sure. I just think that those horns on that body are just like, just they don't even badass. They don't, just, even, everything they don't awesome. even need the horns. Yeah. No. And but so it's just where they live and, and how you have to hunt them. And like for me, sheep hunting typically has been like a marathon. Yeah. Each time. Goat hunting, ibex hunting, it's a sprint. Yeah. It's like a race. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're trying to get to the top oh. as fast as you can to get in a position. And in my mountain goat that I did, I had two eight and a half hour ascents. And it was just nuts. Yeah, yeah. The goat hunting starts where the sheep hunting ends. <laughs> right. And I've noticed that with, with goats, they move. Like, they can move a lot. And we, a lot of days we spent just looking at them at, like, 2,000 feet in the air, you know. So did you hunt them on the during the rut? side of a cliff. It was August. And they're you, on You need to do September. one more in your life. Yeah. And I did mine in November. You need to do a late season in that, the rut. And it's it'd be like a whole new hunt. I I, I, I want to do more goat hunts. And With those, when when it was walking out, I mean, I'd see him jumping on these. There's no, I'm like, what are you, what are you standing on? <laughs> like, that's vertical. Like it's flat. And then I saw a bunch on, um, on a, on a um, dam wall, like thousands of feet up on a dam, and mm-hmm. I don't know where it was. And you're looking to see how did I'm you like, get there? What are how, what are you standing on? And there's just cracks in yeah. the stone, and uh, they're just eating off of that. And oh, it's crazy. So they're even they're, the babies too. When you watch yeah. them, it's like instantly they've got the balance, and it's amazing to it. see. So that I thought that was. So you guys have been all over the place though. You've been into some crazy places and what, what, what is one of the most insane hunts you've been on? Insane as far as the animal or insane as far as the experience? Both. Cause I was watching, we were watching Cole Kramer last night on that hunt. It was Tajikistan, right? Dudes that are guiding him are missing his toe, their toes. Yeah, uh, I mean they're up there without boots and stuff in <laughs> snow. Like the coolest it's experience people. is probably leopard hunting. Really? Yeah. Um, I mean everyone has something that's different. I, I like to be challenged in physically or mentally. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never been challenged mentally like on a leopard hunt. It's uh, there's at some points during the hunt you want to like shoot yourself in the leg and hope you miss your femoral artery. Uh, so global rescue will come get you. Um, it's just, where did you do this hunt? Um, I've, I've done three leopards, so I've done them in, uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe, but I don't know. That's just a cool experience. It's a cool hunt. It's, um, it's not the physical hunt that, that, you know, Dallas and I've been doing here lately, but I mean, there's a lot of mental Mm -hmm. aspects to hunting sheep and goats as well. I mean, there are days that you don't want to climb another step. Yeah. And, but you force yourself to do it. So it takes a lot of mental capacity to be able to continue on some of those hunts. But for that leopard hunt or any of the leopard hunts, my first one I shot on the 15th day of a 15 day safari. Second one I shot on the 18th day of 18 day safari. And the third one I, I got lucky and shot it on the fifth of like 14 days. So, um, I don't know. I just, I've always said that if you, if you had a hunt that maintained the adrenaline level the spike that you got when a leopard showed up, you'd have a heart attack if if it was like, because it's prolonged on other hunts. Like you see the animal and you're trying to get in a position. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours. So your body kind of relaxes and that adrenaline spike drops and you you level out your mm-hmm. breathing. Well, on the leopard hunt, when that thing shows up, that is spike there. is so great that if you were to maintain that, I mean, I think my heart would probably just explode. Really? But um, yeah, that's probably the, the coolest like animal experience have you been on on yeah. that dallas i went on a leopard hunt in tanzania this year and you filmed it yeah we shot an awesome leopard on the last day i sat in the blind for a total of an hour and a half the leopard came in in the daylight perfect lighting got the leopard 
So my ex- leopard experience <laughs> is very <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, most guys like sit like thirty days before they have you know a yeah, big my male leopard. first leopard. I sit sixty something hours in the blind. Mm-hmm. Uh, my second one was probably about it's thirty-five hot. or forty. But it's just uncomfortable. It's miserable. Mm-hmm. Everything about it is miserable. But you're sitting there in this little blind with I, – I, I can only see through my camera. They gave me a tiny like hole so in the this mesh. This blind is like locked down. Tight. Yeah. Yeah, it's like horrible. And so I'm looking. I'm like – Is it because they're that I'm, aware? That, oh, yeah. Oh, they're super like switched on. And so like – I've been in like you guys might have been in like where they put like bamboo or something up around you guys and kind of made the blind. So we've done that. We've had like those old like Amara Step or mm-hmm. Double Bull or whatever. They've had those and they like they, how close they are they trying in. to get you to the? I was eighty leopard. yards, oh. pretty much in all three, eighty to hundred. Yeah, from where we were. I mean, I know a hundred yards seems close, but I know how jacked up I'm going to get. We seemed way too far <laughs> away for me. Really? Like when we got in the blind and I looked at the tree, I'm like. We can't go any closer. I was like, <laughs> I'm on 500. And- so Dallas's <laughs> experience of being in the blind an hour and a half that is super rare. I, I have a friend that is 0 for 10 on leopards, really, and that's kind of that's kind of the norm. But I felt the spike. Yeah, we're, when we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, like you start hearing the birds, and like you can tell something's going on, like commotion, and all of a sudden, I mean this huge. <laughs> cat the lighting i'm gonna have to send you the video to put on here so people can see this yeah. the lighting it's like something out of jungle book yeah and this leopard this huge leopards at the bottom of the tree all of a sudden one jump boom the thing's 15 feet up the tree then it's up there with this cape buffalo quarter hanging from the tree and there's this giant leopard and it's just like my footage, I stabilized yeah. it. I mean, it's still pretty shaky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, <sighs> I mean, that's with everything. But, do, you ha- do you have that footage here? Um, can can I download it from you at yeah. the show? Yeah, I should. And if not, I mean, I, I'll send it to you. Do you have our elk footage? Did you bring that, or is it yes. in your hotel? I have it. I'll go grab it. You know, our hotel is also your hotel. I knew that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Dallas, you know. With all these exotic hunts you've been on, uh, did it feel kind of um, like like child's play when you went and hunted in Montana for elk with us? You want to know the crazy thing is this sounds so weird, but I do miss that. Yeah? Like, I love the traveling and I love that like every, you know filming job is so different like it's different animals it's different environment different cultures like, different yeah different people. cultures different everything's different so it's it's not hard for me to film that you know what i mean like everything that's happening is so new that like i'm just i want to like keep capturing mm-hmm. everything and so mm-hmm. i love it but there are times when it's like 110 degrees and i'm in africa driving around and I know back home the elk are bugling, and I'm like, man, I haven't been elk hunting in a really <laughs> long time. It's been like a couple of years since I've been elk hunting. So, no, it's just as fun. Like going on that elk hunt, mm-hmm. I was so happy and excited, and like that was a blast. Like, oh, dude. so much fun. <laughs> so, no. Nothing gets old. <laughs> we we start pumping up the rafts to float down the canal, and Dallas is like, "Are we really doing this?" <laughs> And then uh, we load up, and dude, it was oh my it gosh. worked. The closer we oh. got down the canal, we're we're getting closer to the bugles. Like as the raft is going down the canal, like the bugles are getting closer. And oh, and that's cool. It's like what in the and world? It sounded it was like we we're so in Jurassic, the Yukon, like floating rafting for moose. But you're in a canal. But we're in a canal between two alfalfa fields. <laughs> <laughs> But it yeah, was I think I sent thing. I think I sent Dallas a text. I was like, "You guys are <laughs> like Texas whitetail hunting elk." That's right. Yeah, but which was so awesome. Have you ever heard elks talk, make that much noise? That kind of noise? No, the vocalization. No, never. You recorded it on your on your phone a couple of times, didn't you? Yeah. Um. And, I mean, that's how good it was and how loud it was. I mean, the iPhones were picking it up. And then, um, yeah, I want to see you. Did you film any of the canal? Uh, it was too dark, or did you get any of that? 
You're going to have to have the good camera guy to get all that. Yeah, true. <laughs> Actually, we've I we've got some of it. There's plenty of footage of uh, Dallas and I hiding time. behind a giant sprinkler in the middle of the alfalfa oh, yeah. field. Yeah. I mean, that was a good position to be in. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, that was a fun hunt. So, um, what what has traveling to all these countries? You know, because how old are you, Dallas? Twenty five. Really? That's it. <laughs> yep. Okay, so. <laughs> And how long have you been traveling doing this? Two years? Two Three, years. Two years? Okay, two. so. This is the maybe age, two and a half. Let's say age 23, you uh, start traveling the world. What's 23 year old Dallas like compared to 25 year old Dallas? Oh, I don't think I had any grasp of the world. And I think the thing that's probably changed the most is my perspective of like the bubble that we live in America, that I mean, almost everything that I'm seeing, like I was clueless to it. And Mm -hmm. I mean, no one else is going to know anything about it unless they were educated about it. Just some of these cultures and the things that we take for granted that, I mean, yeah, are a lot of them super important? No, but... Being able to go get in a car and having a bed to sleep in and not worrying about dying when you drink the water. (laughs) Just like little things. It's like, do not drink that water. Like (laughs) you are in serious jeopardy of Mm -hmm. being incredibly ill. You take water for granted. And there's the perception of a lot of these places is is dangerous. Mm -hmm. People always ask us, did you feel safe? And I think that's the one thing that's opened my eyes more to anything is, man, these people are, that we go, the places we go to, they're just like super nice. Yeah. No, ever. And you that's, go into it with a preconceived that's another notion. Thing, but it's like my mom was texting me on the way back from Tajikistan. She's like, oh my gosh, you're safe. I'm so glad you're safe. <laughs> and I was just like, I never felt threatened. I never I've felt never, not safe. I've never felt not safe. Yes, I've done activities in these places. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, yeah, some of these flights, some of these cliffs we're hiking on. Yes, those are dangerous. But I've never felt threatened by people in anywhere that I've been. In Turkey, in Tajikistan, I mean, all around the world, everyone, most people have a good heart. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And Yeah, at the core, just, we're at the all core, the same. That's not... I mean, throw out the religious issues that, that are around the world. And, I mean, we spent a lot of time in Tajikistan talking to to Zafar about, like, his beliefs and stuff. And mm-hmm. and most of his core beliefs were, were the same as ours. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's like a preconceived idea that people have of, of where we're traveling and the things, the places we get to go. So getting to do it, it I mean, obviously, if I had gotten to do it at 23 or 25, it would have shaped me much differently at an early stage. And, and it's pretty unique and, and awesome that the Dallas has gotten to do it so young. Cause I'm probably the better one to answer the question of, you know, the 23 year old Dallas mm-hmm. versus the 25 year old Dallas. But, um, you know, the 23 year old Dallas was, was, uh, was just, I don't want to use the word immature, but I mean, he's 23 mm-hmm. and, uh, he's grown like a ton in the last two years at just some of the conversations that we've had since, um, and, you know, his, his ideals and his idea of the world has obviously changed. But, like, I see a lot more confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, he was a lot more shy and a lot more quiet at first. Uh, and I know people have a hard time believing that. But uh, <laughs> he just he became more confident in himself and his abilities. And not only behind the camera. Yeah. Um, Dallas has gotten to do some really cool hunts. And, and, and I'm not really... I'm not really referring to him as a hunter or a videographer. Just more as him as a person. person. It, it seems like he's grown... A lot in two years. Now, in that two years, he's been exposed to multiple lifetimes of, of a lot of people getting to travel around the world. So it's been really cool. I'm, I'm super proud that, that, uh, how much I've gotten to see him grow as a person. And, uh, thank you. There's a lot of, a lot no, of cool been, opportunities out there for him been, that he's I've created been, himself. Uh, yeah, very lucky. But the world is a very cool place. And that's a lot of times when I'm over in these places, I'm just thinking to myself, and I wish more people could see some of this stuff. 
I mean, everywhere I go, it's incredible. And I think a lot of people, I mean, I know a lot of people, even friends that I'll talk to and they'll be like, man, that's cool, but I have no desire to go anywhere. Like I'm good hunting mule deer. Like Mm -hmm. I don't want to go over there and it's cool. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a lot of people don't think it's that cool, but being in these other cultures and eating crazy foods and well, the think, long flights. And, I think what you were just saying earlier about, you know, a, a, a echo chamber or a group think like we're in the United States and when you're not exposed to other places, I don't think you can, I think often you, you don't value democracy like you should. You don't value freedoms that we have. You know, it's easy to get on the, um, <clears throat> make America great again kind of stuff. Like it's a bad place or something. And, um, and that's when I wish people spent a little more time in other countries because it would completely change how they view the world. Yeah, But I mean, you just take the lady at, in the yurt in Tajikistan when we just pulled up, <laughs> that lady had absolutely nothing. She was genuinely happy. Mm hmm. In most of these places, it was weird. The less like, they have, the see, happier they are. But see, that's that's some, something that I've seen throughout my life is, like in India, s- some of the poorest people, as long as they're they have food, they're not in danger of dying. You know, they have some place they have food and shelter. Uh, you know, in general, they're really happy. And I've realized that. Um, and I say this all the time. I say it on the podcast all the time. There's absolutely no correlation between money and happiness zero i mean zero. just think of all the things that if, in our mind we think we have to have to make us happy and if and if you to me you, the one thing to ask if you're not happy today right now in this moment doing whatever you're doing more money's not the answer no and yet that seems to be the universal idea is well if i just had this and if i just lived here and if i just drove this car everything would be better. Yeah. It's like, nope, that has nothing to do with your mm-hmm. happiness. Well, I think every time we come back from these trips and we get to be exposed to something like that, I, I genuinely feel like I come back as a better person, as a better husband, as a better father. I just feel like because, you know, it just opens my eyes every single time to a different aspect of someone else's life. Mm-hmm. And, and the things that, that I think, the material things that, that I have, and I think that that's what makes me happy. It's not. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. What I think is neat is uh, all the experiences that enrich your life that you're able to, yeah. to, to go and do. And um, you don't have to have money to have a lot of enriching experiences in the United yeah. States. The, it's out your back door. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're the weird, fortunate. The weird thing is, is you go into that country thinking, oh, they're going to be like, they're going to want to be like us. Yeah, they're gonna want to have what we have, and when we leave, I want to be more like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Um, when when you did the experience, and you started making the YouTube, and it's pretty much YouTube and an Instagram. Mm-hmm. Is is there a Facebook for it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, there's but, a Facebook. But, yeah, there's a, the Facebook is the experience, and then on Instagram, it's. Hunt the, Hunt the experience, and then but on you, YouTube. It's- but you don't have a website presence? I mean, we have a website, but not a presence. Okay. We don't direct anyone to the website. We, we started doing it kind of at the beginning, and but primarily everything changes, and one thing takes off as opposed to another, so you kind of focus on, on what's doing well. And Well, Dallas has a knack for those Instagram stories. That yeah, he's Insta-famous. Really, like, you got to follow Dallas Haymeyer just for the uh, Instagram stories. Plus, you're in, like, some crazy places, and... You get yeah. some cool stuff. So people got to follow for that. Um, but on the experience, you know, as you're doing these hunts, and I, I really appreciate the, the way you've built these films. Thank because you. you're, you're, you're hunting some places that, that, and, and, and some animals that some people are going to go, why? Like, this guy just wants another trophy. And so, but I don't get that feeling when I watch, when I watch the films. Yeah, and that's what we hope. I mean, it it's not about the trophy, and we we have this conversation with people all the time. But your definition of a success on a hunt, um, I think majority of the hunters unintentionally have this visualization of them 
you know, holding their trophy and having photos taken. Um, and, and for the most part, that's people's definition of success. Mm -hmm. Um, I think success is defined in a lot of different ways on a hunt. Um, and ironically, the more I've gotten to do the hunting, it's less about the animal. Um, it's the entire package of the experience. And, and, and as far as the experience goes, we've never captured the experience on film. That's, that's something that's unattainable. Um, we can't show the viewer what it takes to go on these hunts every, every day, the training that we do. Uh, we can't show them how we prepare uh, mentally for the hunts. We can't show them how we decide where we're going or not going. Um, we can't show them like the, one of the most important things I wish we could show them. We can't show them the relationships. It's just hard to show that on, and, and I don't mean we can't, we just, we just can't seem to like capture all of that. I, I do think mm-hmm. it's unattainable. Like, like a specific hunt that I'm thinking of now, a doll sheep hunt. The trophy for that hunt, sure, I got a doll sheep. Um, it was a very physical hunt. It was a hard hunt. I pushed myself past where I thought I could go. But uh, the greatest trophy I took from that hunt was my relationship with Bob Summers. He's a guide. Um, we talk four or five times a week. Dallas will say it's a day. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, he knows my kids. He, your new man wife? Yeah, he knows my wife. Um, uh-huh. It's just... Um, that's the greatest thing I took from that hunt. And I yeah. have this awesome doll sheep, you know, in my house. But I, I look up at the doll sheep, and the first thing I think is, you know, I, I gained a friendship out of this that I would not have had without hunting. It's so hard to communicate that in um, in a soundbite, you know, on Instagram or even YouTube. Mm-hmm. Making a film, you know, where you, you can share those ideas, uh, it, that's a lot of work. And it, it seems it every film you seem to capture – snippets of some of them of yeah. different things you know what i mean like each yeah. film will like capture different things but man when you pull them all into one but you see it you know what i mean like i feel like you know usually we capture one or two of those things in each film mm-hmm. and on devin's elk film i feel like we captured four or five of those things yeah and i feel like yeah i would just, say oh, devin's just, elk hunt is probably the closest thing we came to fully capturing an experience yeah and honestly, probably the second most is, is your mountain goat hunt. Um, I thought that we did a really yeah. good job of capturing Those, some of the ups and downs of hunting with Sawyer getting sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guide actually having to take we over had the like camera duties. Four camera. Yeah, the guide was filming. Like it but, was. <laughs> and something we want to do more in the coming years is we want to have a second videographer yeah. to film the production. Right. Because there's there's so many things that go on that are part of the experience that are really nothing to do with the hunt, Mm -hmm. but, you know, kind of encapsulate the whole aspect of the experience. Yeah. So it's not easy to do where we go, but uh, hopefully some of these North American hunts that we have coming up, we can, we can start doing that. We're still learning, growing, figuring things out, but it's good. We enjoy it. Tell me, you know, I know, I know you guys got to get going. So I, uh, but I want to ask one more question and that's in regards to, let's say a guy has just limited funds but he wants to have, you know, an incredible adventure, maybe, you know, outside of the United States. So maybe Alaska, BC, maybe Tajikistan, whatever, like around the world, maybe tar in New Zealand. Like there's all these different things. Ibex. Well, if a guy has just a, just a little bit of money, but he wants to go and do something amazing, see something different. What's uh what's a hunt that you think uh, is kind of under, you know, what's one that you, you, you'd recommend? Well, first of all, every hunt's attainable for every person. It's all about sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, we make sacrifices every day to do something, you know, whether it's to go buy a new truck or go on an elk hunt or, or whatever. How so, bad do you want it? Yeah. It's, it's how, number one, how bad do you want it? How long are you willing to sacrifice for it? Um, and I mean, that's, I mean, hunting is a microcosm of all of that stuff because you're going to sacrifice on the mountains. You're going to sacrifice trying to get to a certain position. Mm-hmm. It's all about sacrifice. So I don't think anything's unattainable. Um, there's some sheep downstairs that, that are, that are definitely on the edge, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, any of the ibex, man, you can go do most ibex around the world for the same cost as like a good elk hunt here in North America. Yeah. So, um, and and that's just a fascinating. That's a it is it's amazing. New hunt. Zealand's an I'm, awesome place. That's like what you I'm said, saying. Chamois. Number one on my list for people would be tar and chamois in New Zealand. Yeah, that would be I it. I mean, you can you can increase. I mean, if you go with an outfitter, 
you're definitely probably going to get them. I know guys that will go over there and just pay for a helicopter flight to get dropped. So, uh-huh. you know, under two grand, they can get flown up deep into the mountains, dropped off with a buddy or two with tents and just do a spike camp. There's no tags in New Zealand. None of that. So, I mean, really, the only thing you're paying for is your flight there. You can probably drink the water. Yes. And the helicopter (laughs) flight. No, you can't, definitely. (laughs) And if you're super hardcore, which there are a lot of guys that are, all you need is a plane ticket. Go fly there, make some phone calls, get some maps, and... New Zealand. Go hiking. Sure. No tags, nothing. I like that. But anywhere, go anywhere. I mean, just make the sacrifice and do it. You won't regret it. But I think people should make a goal to plan a hunt outside of the U.S. Yeah. I mean, it would really open their Passport eyes. Passport and, and visa, everything, the yeah. whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. Where can people uh, find you guys? They can find us on YouTube at The Experience, on Instagram at Hunt The Experience, and on Facebook, The Experience. And then our Personal pages, we're still pumping out there. You're Dallas Haymeyer on Instagram. So, and Haymeyer is Dallas. I think everybody's got that. Yeah. Just like Texas, Dallas. And then uh, Haymeyer is H E Y. H E M. That's what I said. H E. <laughs> you spell it. You let me spell H-E-M. it. I always have to type it in. H E M E Y E R. Yep. So, Dallas Haymeyer. This is nothing like it sounds, not right. phonetically. So it's just, you just jacked have to go up, with dude. It. Yeah. It's jacked up. Yeah. Um, and then Jason's is uh, M. Jason Price. Yep. M. What's the M for? Michael. No dots. Just no all dots. M. Jason Price. Yeah. Cool. All right, folks. Go uh, go check out these films on YouTube at The Experience and uh, follow these guys. They have some epic adventures and I like the message you're you're yeah. you're sharing and thank you it's good stuff and yeah thanks for having us man that's awesome I, dude i could talk to you guys for hours so we'll have to do we'll this do again, again yeah yeah because i need to get uh i need to i need to go down the the filming road with dallas and Absolutely. ask him all millions of questions on cameras and filming i was scoping I out his camera. gear <laughs> true <laughs> i mean that it's 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 really we don't need any more cameras <laughs> but i i do want a uh Pick your brain because yeah. he was really efficient on that trip. Yeah, so, very. Um, I've been forced to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to figure it out. The one thing that, though, it was cold and his batteries were dying like in like five I minutes. I went through at least – I would think I was down to my last battery when you were making your last belly crawl. I, I went through 12 batteries in one day. And that is yeah. after borrowing – his hand warmers too. But I've learned that if you buy the Sony batteries for the, the a seven, um, they last longer. They don't, they're not as susceptible as yeah. the, to the cold. But you know what I've heard from multiple people? What? The new Sony batteries uh uh-huh. in the R three and the a nine. Oh yeah. Incredible. But those, those but are not video I, <laughs> platforms. No, no, no. It's coming. It has to come. <laughs> Everything's a no, no, video no. platform for Dallas. He told me last night. Yeah. He's like, if it waiting. doesn't come, I'm switching to Panasonic. <laughs> he is I'm waiting. I'm switching. He is. Uh, we were up there on that trip. So sad. I saw him two days ago, and he's like, I thought Sony was going to come out with a new camera. <laughs> well, if you're looking <laughs> for something, we have a camera. small camera Came store. So nine, but just let us know. Camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So very cool, guys. All right. Thanks, thanks for coming man. on. Stay gritty. Yep. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. 
All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>